Hello, I'm Pauline Davies from the Hugh Dan School of Human Communication at Arizona State University. And welcome to the inaugural event of Conversations on Religion, Ethics and Science, or CAUSE. And it's, initiative, it's an initiative led by Professor Barry Ritchie from ASU's Department of Physics. CAUSE is made possible through the generous support of the John Templeton Foundation in association with the Arizona Center for Christian Studies. Well, at this time of divisiveness and incivility in politics and our enhanced awareness of racial inequality, our topic today is particularly appropriate, as is our special guest. Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs served for 22 years as the UK's Chief Rabbi. He has written 31 books and received numerous awards and was made a member of Britain's House of Lords in 2009. His most recent book, just published in the US, is Morality, Restoring the Common Good in Divided Times. And here to talk to him are four panelists, all professors at Arizona State University. Paul Carice is a professor of political philosophy and American political thought, and the founding director of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership. Paul Davies is a theoretical physicist, cosmologist, and astrobiologist, and like Rabbi Sachs, the author of 31 books, and also a Templeton Prize winner. Paul is a Regents Professor and Director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science. Harvard Tirosh Samuelson is Regents Professor of History, the Irving and Miriam Lowe Professor of Modern Judaism, and Director of the Center for Jewish Studies. An intellectual historian, she writes on Jewish philosophy and mysticism, religion, science and technology, and religion and ecology. And our fourth panelist, John Carlson, is a scholar of religious ethics, whose research explores how religious and moral inquiry informs and invigorates our understanding of political life. He is Interim Director of the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict and Co-Director of the Recovering Truth Project, which explores issues of religion, journalism, democracy, and post-truth, which is very appropriate nowadays. So after our formal panel session, there will be time for, for a few questions from you, the audience, to put to Rabbi Sachs. So do please send in your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen as you're listening to the discussions. Now, Rabbi Sachs has to leave us after an hour, but our panelists will stay to tackle more questions for another 15 minutes. But just to begin, let me turn it over to Rabbi Sachs to give a brief introduction to his new book, morality well you never know what's going to happen when a book gets published i had no way of understanding no way of knowing that it would turn out to be very relevant indeed uh, but so it has transpired because during these six months certainly in britain and even more so in the united states what has been revealed has been a fragmented, fissured society with enormous tensions of various different kinds, but a sense that somehow something is very broken. The argument that I put forward in the book is that what is broken is what I call the third domain. The two domains of competition, the market, which is about the competition for wealth, the state, which is about the competition for power, but there is a third arena, the moral arena, which is not about competition, but about cooperation, not about self-interest, but about the common good. It's about caring about others and sensing that we are part of something for which we each carry responsibility, that we are collectively responsible for the creation of a society that will benefit the common good, benefit those who right now are least benefiting from it. Now, that was always a part of British and American society from the 17th century, maybe even earlier, um, until, let us say, the 1950s. But somehow or other, people, we became so affluent, 
So uh, the world around us seemed so uh, relatively free of threats to our peace and security that we just didn't really notice as this entire moral domain became fragmented so that instead of thinking about what's God good for all of us, we kind of focused on what's good for me, what speaks to me. Expressive individualism, in other words. And I suggested that society can't carry on like that, that we do need to be held together in bonds of mutual responsibility, because without it, we will indeed fragment. Well, that was a kind of um, conceptual theoretical possibility when I wrote the book, but almost as soon as I'd finished, it became a very visible reality that we've lived with for the last six months and may well live with for the next 10 years. So that's basically the statement. We need to get back to that moral dimension. We need to move back from a society that focuses only on I to one that focuses also on we. That's a really a very nice introduction to our next section and we're going to be moving on to the topic of religion, morality and the common good and uh, joining Rabbi Sachs for a conversation are professors Harva Tirosh Samuelson and John Carlson. Rabbi Sachs, it's wonderful to be with you on this session. I would like to start by referring to an older book of yours, uh, Dignity of Difference, How to Avoid the Clash of Civilization. It's a book that you published in 2002. And there you promoted uh, pluralism, whether it's religious, ethnic, or ideological. But in the most recent book that we are talking about today, the book Morality, uh, you find multiculturalism to be the source of much of our current malaise. So my question to you is this, uh, how do we protect pluralism and diversity without undermining national or cultural unity? To put it slightly differently, uh, does not pluralism which you endorse necessarily result in multi multiculturalism, which you condemn? Uh, shorter answer is no. Trouble, Hover, is that <laughs> I said it all out in another book. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it's a book that I wrote uh, in 2007 or published in 2007 called The Home We Build Together. I'll tell you exactly why I wrote that book. I wrote uh, Dignity of Difference because of 9-11. And it's about religiously motivated violence. It's about the threat to Western societies from the outside, from um, cultures that have not accepted the modern world and actually feel very threatened by it. However, in 2005, 7, 7, 7th of July, we had our own big suicide bombings in London. Um, and I was consulted at the time um, by many of the government ministers and by our um, equivalent of CIA because they wanted guidance. And my book, The Home We Build Together, is a critique of multiculturalism. But I have not retracted one millimeter from my commitment to pluralism. So let me explain. What I argue for in the home we build together, and it's implicit in the new book, is what I call integrated diversity. And if I can put that simply, each of us, Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, uh, etc., or different ethnicities, or each of us, we each are unique, and that uniqueness is important. And that uniqueness means that we can contribute to the common good, what only we can give. So it is deeply respectful of diversity, but that, that diversity is all focused on contributing to the common good, making our particular contribution to Britain, the Sikhs, the Jains, the Zoroastrians, the Baha'i. 
So for instance, if I can give you a little example, um, after the, um, 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 do you remember we had a prime minister called David Cameron? We sure do. <laughs> and you know, he put forward an idea called the Big Society. So I took um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, the head of the Catholic Church, Cormac Murphy O'Connor, and the three of us, I said, we're gonna sit down with David Cameron because this is about building community, local community. And I said, we're gonna sit with the prime minister and see how we, each of us in our own community can contribute to the big society by, 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 you know, by building communities and then giving the gifts of those communities to the country at large. And it was very nice. It was actually very moving. And then subsequently, the Archbishop of Canterbury and myself um, invited all the leaders of all the faiths in Britain to a conference for a day in Lambeth Palace, talking about what each of us could do. That was distinctive of our faith community. Um, and that was one of the things we did. It wasn't the only thing by any means. I also did um, a project with Prince Charles called Respect, which was about going town after town after town. We began in Birmingham and bringing the faith communities and bringing them to the center of the town and essentially getting them, all of them, to do hospitality for the town because we all have different foods. I mean, we all have different songs, we have different foods, we have different rituals. Uh, Prince Charles opened the first one. And it was a way of saying, let's take our differences into the public square and show that we respect one another because each one of us can do what the others can't do. Now, that concept of integrated diversity, which I haven't really seen developed anywhere else, is a way of valuing plurality and difference, while at the same time, not losing the centrality of the common good. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Well, I, um, Pauline, may I have a follow-up question? Yes, you may. So is a, I, I'm very glad to hear the, the focus on this concept of integrated diversity. As a Jewish religious leader and theologian, uh, could you help us uh, resolve some of the tensions especially the tension between philosophical or scientific universality and religious, ethnic, and historical uh, particularity. Okay, I'm going to say, oh, sorry. Yeah, kind of what, how can, what can we learn from Judaism about this fundamental conundrum between universality and particularity? <clears throat> Let me tell you a little story, which I find absolutely mind-blowing. It's contained in Exodus chapter one. Pharaoh has summoned the midwives, Shifra and Pua, and said, look at the child, all the children that are born, and if they're male, then kill them. Now, Shifra and Pua, says the Bible, feared God and did not do what Pharaoh said. This is the first recorded instance in history of civil disobedience. When people look for a source for civil disobedience, they go to Thoreau in the 19th century. I go to Shifra and Pua uh, a lot, lot earlier than that. Um, now, what's really interesting, and it's point made by our commentators, by Abarbanel and by uh, Shadal Lutzato, is that they say, who were Shifra and Pua? Were they Israelites or non-Israelites? Mm. And the answer they give is that they must have been non-Israelites because Pharaoh would never have asked Israelite midwives to murder children of their own people. So these were non-Israelites. And they refused to obey an immoral order. And the Bible actually has a lovely touch it says, and God blessed them with, he gave them houses, i.e. they had been infertile until then, and now they had children of their own. Because the only other case that could be considered 
um, civil disobedience in the ancient literature is Antigone. And Antigone is a tragedy. But the story of Shifra and Pua is not a tragedy. So here they follow universal values. They see immediately, kill an innocent child, that's wrong, that's morally wrong. Now these are not Israelites. So what is particular and what is universal in the ethic of the Bible? Very simple. Morality is universal. Holiness is particular. Mm. That's and the Bible is constantly doing this. In the very next chapter, you get who? Pharaoh's daughter. Hitler's daughter, okay? She breaks her father's decree, adopts, saves the life of the child, adopts the child, gives the child his only name, his only name to tell us that there really are, is a universal moral sense. It's called being God-fearing. That's, that's what the Bible calls it. Yirat Elohim. Mm -hmm. So morality is universal, but holiness is particular. We have to move on to John's question now. Hi, John. Hi. Hello, Rabbi Sachs. Uh, so honored to be with you today to discuss this really important new book that you've written. Um, you have uh, talked a bit about the fragmentation and the forces that are driving that from individualism, consumerism, identity politics. Uh, here in the United States, we're seeing this fragmentation through race, religion, class, education level, political tribe, urban and rural divides. I think one a particularly important division that overlays many of those others uh, is how we get our news. And it shapes and reflects our view of the world which creates actually very different visions of reality. Um, it intensifies the post-truth post culture. It erodes our faith in democracy. These are questions that those of us in our Recovering Truth Project are really wrestling with right now. So my question for you, and forgive me, this will be a softball question for you, is how do we form a common morality when we don't even share a common reality? Uh, that is to say, how do we forge consensus about shared values when we don't even agree on the facts. Well, look, can I, can I give you a very simple example on this? Please. Uh, we have um, restarted public transport, uh, underground buses. But of course, public transport puts us in fairly close proximity to one another, especially uh, the subway, I mean, which is really, um, a fairly toxic environment. And so the government has ruled quite rightly that anyone using public transport has to wear a mask. Now, I don't know if moral philosophers have yet understood the conceptual significance of the mask. I mean, our kind of mask, I don't mean Nietzsche's kind of mask. So, so um, and the answer is that a mask basically does not protect you from other people, but it protects other people from you. So wearing a mask is an act of pure altruism. It says, I really care about other people. Now, I'll tell you what happens. You go on the subway today, and you will find most people wearing a mask, but not everyone. The reason most people are wearing a mask is that they understand that create, to create a safe environment in a difficult situation like that, each of us has to play our part in protecting others from us. But what about the people who don't wear a mask? And there are, in every compartment, a few people who don't wear a mask. They say, the hell with it. I'm concerned with me. I'm not going to have the discomfort of wearing this mask, and I'm pretty safe because everyone else is wearing a mask. Now, this is known, as you know, in the whole issue of the commons as being a free rider. You are taking advantage of everyone else's sacrifice, uh, but you're not yourself paying the price. You're not sacrificing for the sake of others. Now, 
the difference between um, other regarding behavior and free rider is so basic that even animals understand this. You don't need advance. Look, I mean, obviously we're all going to go to Arizona and learn this stuff, but I mean, even if you're a social animal who is not yet human, you work this stuff out because animals do not like free riders. So this is not rocket science. What is common good? It is wear a mask when using public transport. And sometimes I think we make life terribly difficult for ourselves by dealing with the higher reaches, which are genuinely difficult, there's no question. There is more than one vision of the good life and, and nobody can deny this. Um, it's, it's what Alistair, it's what uh, Isaiah Berlin taught us, you know, incommensurable life forms. But the real things that matter uh, are the things that are near, near to the ground, you know. And we're making a huge mistake in saying, no, we have individual liberty and we shouldn't inhibit this. As far as I can see, we have individual liberty to drive a car. But we do not have individual liberty to drive dangerously. So if somebody stops me driving because I'm a dangerous driver, that is not a restriction on my freedom because I do not have the freedom to drive dangerously. I only have the freedom to drive taking into account the interests of others. So I don't think there's an insoluble problem here. Thank uh, you very much. Um, now it's time actually to move on to Paul Carice and Paul Davies. And I think they're going to be talking about um, or asking questions about politics, civil society, and the common good. Okay. Thank you, Pauline. Yes, Hello. Um, which Paul goes first? I can't remember. Uh, I'll start, Paul. Um, <laughs> Rabbi Sachs, thank you so much for this book. It's a great gift, a uh, timely gift right now. And thank you for this conversation. I wanted to ask you about your recommendation that we rediscover Alexis de Tocqueville and his insight in Democracy in America almost two centuries ago, that there's a crucial role for local and voluntary associations to maintain a healthy social political order, that this better balances the I and the we. And particularly you argue that he was correct to observe that there was a tendency in all modern democracies to elevate a, the state or the government, a central government, because of the focus on economic and material progress. Uh, and that this would erode local communities, religious communities uh, as well. And this had made America, in Tocqueville's view, a more, a more healthy and more balanced uh, democratic republic. And then more recently, you cite Robert Putnam as affirming this uh, insight um, that Tocqueville's warning has been uh, vindicated, so to speak. So. My question is, what steps could educators and other leaders do to try to raise attention to Tocqueville's insight and perhaps to establish some kind of consensus on the importance of that insight? Well, probably we should declare democracy in America as a divinely inspired sacred text. Then we might actually get around to reading it once a year because I think everyone should read it once a year. Um, I came to it rather late in life because uh, the philosophy degree that I did didn't have any political philosophy in it at all. So I came late in life and I, I, I just fell in love with this man. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's such an insightful book. And what he's saying essentially is for democracy to work, each of us has to do part of that work. We can't leave it all to the government. And it actually occurred to me that if you look carefully in the Bible as well, in the first book of Samuel, chapter 8, where the people come to Samuel asking for a king, and God says, you know, tell them what's going to happen. <laughs> tell them how many taxes they're going to have to pay, all the rest of it, big state and so on. Um, and Samuel tells the people just how much of their liberties they're going to give up by creating this highly centralized monarch. 
And I suddenly realized that what, what the Bible is saying at that point is there ought to be limits on the size of the state. Not because there's anything wrong with the state, but because we should not lose those altruistic activities that we engage in every time we do something that is not done by the state. What happened, of course, in the 19th century is that uh, individuals and groups and charities and churches in the States and in, and, and in Britain built schools. They built hospitals. They, they created a vast infrastructure. Now, I don't think we're going to give that back to people. But what Robert Putnam tells us on the basis of a lot of research is that the more you engage in altruistic activity, the more, you know, the more co you do, in fact, contribute to the common good. And um, he says that those energies are still there in religious congregations. Um, so that's really where I'm coming from. I, you know, every synagogue is an exercise in community building. It's a, it's community building is kind of central to it. Um, but I do find that the willingness to volunteer is undiminished completely to this day. Near the beginning of the pandemic, the National Health Service in Britain was about to be overwhelmed. And somebody put out a call. Are you willing to volunteer to help the National Health Service? And three quarters of a million people volunteer in the space of two days. So, you know, we've seen that those civic energies are there and we have to find work for them to do, otherwise they will atrophy. So just a quick follow-up before we turn to Paul Davies. So are you, are you suggesting we, sh as academics, let's say, should re reverse engineer our curricula a bit? We should look around at what's actually happening and listen to someone is, uh, who's done the research about current affairs like Putnam and others and, and think about adjusting our, our curricula so that we, we address these current needs and, and realities more effectively. Well, I, you know, I, I taught in um, America for five years just recently, <clears throat> basically in New York. And every single one of my students was engaged in that kind of activity, you know, they, they, they were looking for things to do, but they, every one of them took on a welfare project. Uh, one, one of them, <laughs> it was very funny. Um, I was teaching around uh, Greenwich Village and the Bowery is not very far away. And there are a lot of people sleeping on the streets in that part of New York. And one of my students went in and asked these people, um, what's the worst thing about it? And they said, our feet are so cold. So she said, you know, would socks be helpful to you? And they all said, yes. So she took it on herself as her big project to gather socks to help people who are, you know, at the Bowery, at the um, sleeping in the streets. Uh, it may be a small project, but my goodness me, I could see that it gave her life. A lot of direction and meaning and uh, we took a not I uh, uh, another rabbi took a group of Jews and Muslims every year for a week to work with a disaster zone in the state in other words to build up friendships across faiths but not by doing it through interfaith dialogue but by actually helping people who'd lost their homes in floods in hurricanes and so on. So I'm not, I don't know, I mean, I'm open, you will know so much better than me, whether this is best done by changes to the formal curriculum, or by changes to the informal culture. But one way or another, a university is a wonderful place to do this. And the habits those students will form as a result will stay with them a lifetime. Thank you so much, Paul. <clears throat> yes, uh, hello, Rabbi Sack. Oh, hi. Uh, I'd like to pick up where your conversation with Harvard left off, 
with your term uh, integrative diversity. Because as I was reading your book, I thought, well, can we point to a part of the world where uh, people are making an effort uh, to uh, put the we and I back into balance? And it occurred to me that the European Union, I've always been a very strong supporter of this, uh, is a great example of at least an attempt to do this. Here we have a continent riven by war for centuries, and all these nations, nearly 30 nations, uh, deciding to uh, come together, not uh, through conquest or revolution, but uh, voluntary association uh, to closer and closer integration while retaining their diversity. I think it's one of the great success stories of the post-war years. But of course, uh, as you well know, it is now threatened by Brexit and other forces uh, pulling in, in the opposite direction. So uh, sitting there as you do within the British political system, uh, can you give us your perspective on the European Union? Is it uh, a speed bump on the road? Is this a success story? <laughs> uh, or is it headed for oblivion? The European Union is everything you say it is. It's one of the greatest efforts ever to say we have fought two world wars in the past and many other wars before then. Let us so join our destinies that such things will become impossible. And I think one has to stand and salute that, whatever your view on Brexit is and, and so on. So the European Union is a major, major achievement. The real problem is actually Britain, not the European Union. Britain never could decide, are we part of the are we part of Europe or are we part of that association with whom we fought in World War II? Do our destinies belong together with America and the Commonwealth? And that indecision has been part of Britain's thing since the very beginning. I mean, almost since the 1950s. Um, and um, you know, the, 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 the British attitude towards the European Union um, has been ambivalent all the way through. As far as Britain is concerned, the um, other thing is Schopenhauer's wonderful question, which is what do porcupines do in the winter? If they stay too far apart, they freeze. But if they come too close together, uh, they injure one another with their spikes. So Britain never could work out how much is too close and how much is too distant. And the end result is that nobody quite knows where we're going, what we're doing, or where we're going to end up. Um, is that fair, Paul, or am I doing a uh, disservice to my beloved country. You no, know, I, I, I think I agree with pretty much what you say. Uh, I, I happen to be uh, um, an anti-Brexiteer, but we're not going to get into my politics here, um, because I wanted to uh, pick up on another theme that I found amusing in your book, which was your reference to cricket. And yes. the set of values that sort of revolve around what's, uh, what's cricket and, uh, and what's not, and, uh, and uh, something that's cricket is what a decent fellow might do or believe in. Uh, and as you know, I'm talking to you now from uh, Australia, where I'm a sort of COVID refugee, uh, and this is a cricket uh, crazy country. And the values here are really starkly different to both the United States and, and the UK, because one of the national characteristics is something called mateship. Uh, you look after your mates. Uh, and it's, uh, it's very ingrained into society and you notice it. So when the COVID-19 restrictions came in, the Prime Minister uh, came on television to say, why would you obey these restrictions? Well, this is Australia. In Australia, you look after your mates. And the very same day, there was a, a quote uh, from a student in Florida who was objecting to these uh, same restrictions, saying, uh, this is America. In America, you do what you want. And it seems to me that the uh, conjunction of these two comments uh, really rather precisely points out the, the different attitudes in different countries, uh, mateship on the one hand and rugged individualism on the other. 
I'm not making a judgment as to which is right and wrong, but it, it, this is a, an emblem of the I we tension. Uh, and I wonder if you have any comment on uh, the Australian way of, uh, of doing things. Paul, you could not be more correct. Cricket is Britain's single greatest contribution to moral philosophy. Um, it is a wonderful form of moral education and always so functioned uh, within the British educational system. And it, it was, and I hope still is, an incredibly civilizing force. It certainly involved teaching people to look after their mates and not to let the team down. And um, I'm, I'm only sorry that um, things got a tiny, tiny bit more aggressive since then, the 20 overs and the floodlit stuff. And, you know, it's not, it's not quite what it used to be. From a Jewish point of view, the idea that you can have a game that goes on for five days and may not even result in a result, uh, this is just mystical beyond belief. It's, it's just lovely how to slow down the metabolism and, uh, you know, a, a enjoy a, a different pace of life. So there we are. Um, let us add to the university curriculum, not just Tocqueville's democracy in America, but some practical tuition in the art of cricket. Very much, the uh, two Pauls, um, Paul Carice and Paul Davies. And now it's really time to move on to some of your questions, from the questions from the audience. And if you do have some questions, don't forget to send them through to us. There's a little toggle at the bottom of your screen. So let's start um, with, we've had so many coming in. Um, here's one from Bradley Greger, and he says, how is the common good defined? And who defines the common good? Uh, my book uses the concept of covenant. And covenant is actually something that any society defines for itself. And that really is what the first um, Puritans did when they came to the United States. Um, they, as it were, agreed that they would pursue certain ideals and that that would shape the country and the society they wanted to build. And they pledged to one another a commitment that they would do just that. So a covenant society is different from any other because it is based on moral values. I mean, Every society has moral values, but only a covenant society is actually built on them. And those values are stated, obviously, uh, in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Abraham Lincoln repeats them. Um, in the Gettysburg Address, uh, you know, dedicated to the proposition, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, new birth. Of and this is what G.K. Chesterton was referring to, I think very unfairly, when he derided America for being a nation with the soul of a church. America was a nation defined by certain moral commitments. And those commitments have force because people came together and signed a document saying, we commit ourselves to these things. So the common good does not depend on some philosophical proposition. It does not depend on some religious revelation. It depends on um, what the Declaration of Independence calls the consent of the governed. And that really is what a covenant society is. Right, well, here's another question, and I think it can follow on. In your book, um, you talk about three ways of uniting a country, 
I think you uh, talk about shared national narrative, national service and national holidays. Um, can you actually comment a little bit more about those um, ideas for uniting a country? Would it yeah. work in the United States? Pardon? Would it work in the United States? Yeah, let's take the United States for a moment. Have you, do you, you know, I want you to imagine walking around Washington and visiting the monuments. So you go to Lincoln's, the Lincoln Memorial, and you have there on the one side, Gettysburg Address, on the other side, Second Inaugural. You go to the Jefferson Memorial with screeds of text engraved in marble. You go to the Roosevelt Memorial with its six rooms with key sentences from each generate each decade, you know, we have nothing to fear, but fear itself. And then you go to the Martin Luther King Memorial with, it's more than a dozen quotations from his speeches. In other words, in America, a memorial is something you read. Now come to London and um, go to Parliament Square and you will discover the following, that the monument to David Lloyd George consists of three words, David, Lloyd, George. Nelson Mandela gets two, and Churchill, who coined at least as many memorable sentences as anyone else in history, gets one word, Churchill. So in Britain, memorials are not something you read, but in America, they are something you read. Why? Because America, being a country of immigrants, needed to acclimatized to absorb generation after generation of immigrants. And to do that, they had to learn the national story, which they learned at school, which they saw inscribed on monuments, and so on and so forth. There was an American story. And that story was told until two generations ago. I don't know what stopped American schools telling the American story, but I pick up the fact that schools stopped doing so some time ago. So there is today no American story, but there was from 1620 until a couple of generations back. Why do you tell a national story? Because that's where identity comes from. As Jews, every single year on the festival of Passover, we tell our people's story. The Exodus from Egypt, we drink, we eat the unleavened bread of affliction, we taste the bitter herbs of slavery, we drink the wine of freedom. Every Jew knows what it is to be a Jew because every Jew learns the story. If you want to sustain identity, tell the story. Now, Britain stopped telling the story a very long time ago. And this is an incredible mistake on the part of both nations because it means that all we have left is individual minority groups and identity politics and nothing by way of overarching narrative to tell us who we are. Could America bring it back again? Absolutely. And the way they do it is they commission Lynn manuel Miranda, author of Hamilton, who has shown exactly how you tell a national story in a new and exciting and inclusive way casting Jefferson and Washington and all the rest as African Americans or as Hispanics, using rap music and doing all these things. I, 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 I think Hamilton is, uh, is the role model here if you want to re-engage in a national narrative and help Americans once again feel, I am an American, I belong to this country, and I must contribute to it because it contributes to me. Well, Betsy Lane has uh, sent in a question and it, again, it sort of follows on. And she's actually asking, how do we come together when so many are scared of the other, you know, nationality versus nationality, color versus color, religion versus religion. So it's not just within a nation, it's between nations as well. How do we come together when we're scared? I wish I could give you an easy answer. The trouble is I'm in England, so it's, it's, it's not really fair. But um, what you have to do is this. 
you have to get really, really respected leaders from the different groups to come together personally and visibly and for them to go together to certain hotspots and diffuse the tension. So for instance, um, I mentioned that in 2005, we had our own big suicide bombing. Well, a couple of days later, we had a big, big public gathering at, in Trafalgar Square. And the leaders of all the faiths just came on together and stood together as we spoke and we sang and we um, helped the people go through their grief. Now, somebody should have done that um, in Portland, Oregon. Somebody should have done that in Kenosha. Somebody, groups of people, Christian leaders, black leaders, all the, all the minorities should have come together in a sign of collective grief. And so um, created an atmosphere that people could come to a mixed grouping like that and not feel fear. And believe me, it's doable. Thank you. Question from Jita Arnold. So she's writing, Rabbi Sachs says he is not inclined to pessimism despite his diagnosis that we are fragmented and too self-interested. What makes him so hopeful? Okay. <laughs> Here are two words that sound the same and absolutely aren't. Optimism and hope. Optimism is the belief that things are going to get better. Hope is the belief that if we work hard enough together, we can make things better. Optimism is a passive virtue. Hope is an active one. It needs no courage whatsoever, just a certain naivete to be an optimist but sometimes it takes a great deal of courage to have hope. Speaking as a Jew, I say that knowing our history over many centuries, no Jew can be an optimist, but no Jew worthy of the name ever lost hope. And that is the difference. Okay, thank you. And there's a, a quick question. We'll have to be quick on this one. It's from Audrey Thacker. And she's, she writes, moral and ethical issues are not political, but today they are being politicized, used by individuals and groups for political gain. And how do we combat this? Hmm. I try and do it by personal example. So um, I've been a member of the House of Lords. I'm, I'm a member of the British Parliament. I've sat in the House of Lords since 2009. And I sit on what we call the cross benches, which means reserved for those of no particular party. I have made many speeches in the House of Lords, some of which, if you're interested, you can see on YouTube. The great advantage of speeches in the House of Lords are that they're very short. But not one of those speeches is on a political matter. It's always on a moral matter in the broadest sense. I've been there now for 11 years and I have not cast a single vote because I believe that religious figures should have a voice, but not a vote and that there really is something different between morality and politics. So I agree with you. Some people confuse the two, and it's very dangerous to confuse the two, but I've simply kind of tried to show uh, by personal example what it is to be able to speak 
in moral terms in Parliament without ever straying into party politics. And thank you very much, uh, Rabbi, and the audience for those questions. And we're going to turn back to our panelists now. We're going to have all four of them. And the issue they're going to address is, what can we do now? And uh, who wants to ask the first question? Can I go? <laughs> go ahead, because it picks up exactly uh, where Rabbi Sachs just left off. Uh, the biologist E.O. Wilson uh, has said that we have Paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike 21st century technology, and that this is an unhappy mix. Well, we can't really change our emotions and we can't uh, roll back the technology, uh, but we can look for new institutions. So given this crisis that you reflect on in your book, and given that you uh, just been talking about the House of Lords, indeed a medieval institution. Can we come up with new institutions to repair some of the damage you've been talking about? It's entirely conceivable that we can, that what we're doing right now um, by electronic communication can create, as it were, new forms of parliament or public conversation. But personally, I would vote for the renewal of an old one, not the creation of a new one. And that is the university itself. Oh, yes. Somebody, somebody once said, very wise thing, that of any institution, don't ask what it does, ask of what conversations is it the arena. And I think the university, over and above its teaching role and its research role, is the natural arena for the national conversation through which the leaders of the future ask, what kind of a society do we seek to create when we have the opportunity to do so? And that would breathe new life into the university. And I think breathe new life into America and Britain. Rabbi Sachs, can I jump in here on a question that um, is related to the, the one I first asked, which is how do we form some kind of consensus um, on moral issues and others without, a, uh, uh, without some common starting points and has that we're crossing. And um, your, your friend and colleague, Michael Sandel, has been writing about the, uh, the, the great divide between uh, the universities and the products of universities, those who have college educations and those who don't, who, uh, who look quite differently at universities or never come in contact with them. And uh, I, I worry perhaps that some of the biggest divisions that we see in this country, our own country right now, are between um, uh, the, the educated and those who don't hold college, uh, college degrees and thus are never going to maybe come into contact with some of the ideas that you're putting forward here today. Um, so maybe you would say a little bit word about how, um, uh, how we bridge that kind of divide. Um, Michael Sandel <clears throat> is a superstar in China, I'm sure you're aware that over 30 million people in China have followed his Justice 101. And what Mike, Michael does at Harvard, which is what thrills the Chinese so much, is he walks up and down the stage of this wonderful Harvard lecture hall and engages the audience in conversation. In other words, Michael Sandel is Socrates. And if Michael Sandel can communicate with 30 million Chinese, I think that kind of academic, you know, that the great academic, but who is capable of simplification, um, this could well be a new role for the university. Because once you talk about um, 
this, this kind of um, access to great ideas, um, you are in fact opening up the university not to the 20 year olds, but to the 40 or the 60 year olds. And many of those 40 and 60 year olds are actually very, very bright, but they never had that chance before. The thing that told me that there is a huge hunger for ideas is, I'm sure you know about this, the, um, the uh, enterprise called TED. TED makes ideas really exciting um, and finds a way of spreading them uh, right, around the, uh, yeah, right around the world. So that is one half of an answer. The other point, though, that Mike is making and will make in his new book, uh, it hasn't come out yet in Britain, is meritocracy. That somehow meritocracy creates this fundamental divide between um, the more and less intellectually gifted and so on. And of course, he's entirely right to raise the problems of meritocracy. Um, and we just have to find other ways of recognizing talent and contribution that is not necessarily intellectual and to give it some kind of public recognition. Not quite sure how you do that. Well, as the uh, COVID and, pandemic has certainly helped us to, many of us to appreciate the value of those who are continuing to get our society, keep our society moving and providers. Um, I think that's one way. Thank you. And, and, and you know what happens in Britain, I'm sure you do the same thing in the States. You know, for, for, for months, every Thursday at eight o'clock in the evening, you know, everyone came out of their houses and just applauded those workers, the health workers and the many, many other people. So I do feel that we were, for the first time, really recognizing the people who tend to be unseen and unthanked. Well, we've um, really not got time for any more questions to Rabbi Sachs because he's got to leave us in um, well, just a couple of minutes. So I want to uh, thank Rabbi Sachs for joining us because it's been a fascinating discussion. And thank you to our four panelists. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned Rabbi Sachs has to leave us now. But you, the audience, don't go away because they were saying goodbye to Rabbi Sachs. Our panelists will be addressing more of the issues that you've put to us. And uh, I've got a first question here. So goodbye, Rabbi Sachs. And I hope you're going to be able to join us in real life at ASU before too long. As that soon as possible. So exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, so we've had so many more questions for Rabbi Sachs, but unfortunately he has to... Um, uh, leave us. So let's go to a question to the panel from Scott Jones. And this is, how do we develop a public theologically un and spiritually informed morality in the wake of populism on the left and right, which seems to be committed to a renewed sense of tribalism? Mm. So who's going to address that? Is that Harvard? Yeah, okay, yeah, I, I will try to do so. I, it's an excellent question, and my answer would be by teaching intellectual history. In other words, if we approach it from an historical perspective, then you don't get into the politicization uh, of, of morality as, an, as a person indicated in one of the earlier questions. So we need to teach the history of Western thought, the history, which includes theology, it includes the history of science, it includes the history of philosophy. And our problem has become um, evident in a certain kind of poverty, a poverty of our uh, historical awareness. And we need to revive that. And that means a kind of a traditional approach to learning in some ways, but I think it actually enhances the quality of the university. Uh, not the other way around. So that, that would be my answer. Maybe Paul Corrice has a slightly different approach. No, I, I agree with all that. I think one extension of it would be to think about the uh, reconnecting higher education universities and schools, as we would call them, precisely on that point. I, Rabbi Sachs mentioned this at one point about talking uh, uh, with young people about a national story. In the American situation, the, the story would include vigorous debate and disagreement about 
ideas that we generally share uh, in common. Uh, and that, that would mean some more time for what is now called social studies uh, in K-12 schools, especially public schools, and, and civic education. What, what does it mean to be a citizen of this self-governing political community? I'll add one uh, example of this. You mentioned the opening phrases of the Declaration of Independence or near the opening, uh, but to make his point, if you read all the way through to the Declaration of Independence, the final statement is that we mutually pledge our lives, our fortunes, our sacred honor to protect and defend these individual rights. That's the, that's the I and the we balance. And, and then you could teach the intellectual history at the university level for all the teachers about, well, how could the Declaration be such a complicated document? Having some religious elements and, and enlightenment elements and the I and the we, and you could do that throughout American uh, history. Yeah. Okay, so um, we've actually got uh, a question. I think this is probably more directed to Paul Davies, and uh, it's from Mr. Lenny Esprisotto, and he asks, does a presupposition of philosophical naturalism limit our scientific investigation into questions of causes, including ultimate causes? So maybe you should try and ad address that, Paul. Yeah. <coughs> Hello, Lenny. I think it's Esposito. Uh, and uh, thank you for this question, because this is a subject that I have uh, worked on myself and thought a very great deal about. So what I'm going to give you is the Paul Davies version, not the Rabbi Sachs uh, version of the answer to this question. So uh, I'm a scientist, and so I prefer to believe that we can explain the world in terms of science. I don't like uh, the idea of miracles or supernatural intervention. But uh, over dinner parties, people always want to know, well, uh, that's well and good, but how did the universe come to exist in the first place? Uh, uh, it couldn't have come from nothing. Uh, what uh, caused the universe to happen? What caused the Big Bang to go bang? Uh, and uh, at this point, uh, I uh, say, well, uh, we, we don't know uh, exactly about the uh, uh, ultimate origin of the universe, but at least in one simple version, the version that I learned uh, as a student, uh, the Big Bang is the origin of time and space itself, uh, not just uh, the origin of matter and energy. And that goes all the way back to St. Augustine of Hippo, who said that the world was made with time and not in time. Uh, and so uh, that means the notion of a cause in the usual sense uh, is a bit meaningless. And so a lot of uh, scientists jump on this and say, look, uh, we don't have any need of God or anything supernatural because um, uh, there, there was, uh, it's meaningless to talk about the cause of the universe as a whole. But that's a bit of an intellectual sleight of hand because uh, to say that the universe can bring itself into existence in accordance with physical law uh, means that we have to assume that the laws of physics somehow transcend the universe, that so they exist independently of the universe and are capable of bringing it into being. And that's a point of view that, that uh, I find very congenial, that uh, the laws of physics can do the job. But, of course, you must ask, where did the laws of physics come from and why do they have the form that they do? And I think that's the proper place, not to talk about ultimate causes, but the explanation of the world in terms of the law-like nature of the universe we live in and to ask about those laws. That's the proper meeting place uh, between science and theology in my view. But I must emphasize this in my view, not Rabbi Sachs' view. Does anyone else want to add anything or is uh, that full enough? <laughs> Dealt with that. <laughs> a, a, a footnote from the humanities and social sciences side. There's quite a lot in the book about his argument um, following a, a, a mentor, Alistair McIntyre, argument with the uh, uh, trend in the humanities, uh, but also in forming the social sciences, uh, Nietzsche's influence, uh, which would never look for first causes because it, the assumption is rationality itself is a constructed thing. There is no common reason and no common investigation. Uh, and he, R Rabbi Sachs, looks to partly the theoretical adequacy of that, but also the practical effects on the university and the practical effects on, on liberal democracies of that, that fragmented view that there can't be a common inquiry about the truth. Uh, so I think that's another very powerful argument that people should grapple with. Uh, I recommend that they get, get the book and grapple with that. 
Yeah, interesting. Uh, well, another question from uh, Mrs. Laura Roskind. Can democracy and equality be preserved in a state of chaos and racism? Who wants to try? I'll take that one. No. <laughs> Can you explain why? Well, of course, much depends on what one means by democracy, but we mean generally today in this society, a liberal democracy, which is not simply absolute rule of the majority over and against anything, any rights, uh, limits of power, et cetera. So uh, the, the, there are so many forces right now, I think, that are under right, undercutting uh, democracy uh, and uh, inequality really of any sort can be a threat of to democracy, um, but some forms of inequality are explicit, overt, and, um, and particularly pernicious. Uh, and inequality being based upon race uh, is, is one of the most um, uh, obvious and abhorrent that we've struggled with in our own history, and we obviously continue still to struggle with uh, today, uh, whether it's any, as simple as anything from slavery and segregation to the right to vote to uh, massive forms of inequality and other forms of um, privilege access, et cetera, that are withheld or um, as we're seeing today, um, you know, police brutality uh, that is inequitably uh, uh, applied to, uh, to African-Americans. Okay. Can I, I chime in on that again? One, another interesting theme of the book that people should grapple with is his argument for restoring civility as a virtue in public life as well as in, in universities. Uh, and as I was mentioning, that, that, can, that can happen in, in schools as well. So that we, if, if by chaos, the, the questioner means uh, in, in part polarization, the, the angry discord that we have in all dimensions of public life. John's leading a project right now about uh, the media and, and journalism coping with that. Um, it, it, part of the chaos is uh, a, you know, a, a turn toward the moral condemnation of people who disagree with you about a public policy question, about how to frame a public policy question, about how to discuss it. If people disagree with you, they must be morally bad or they've got bad motives. Uh, and it's, it can be true in a liberal democracy that there are some people who are, you know, that we would say that, that point of view is really outside any acceptable parameters of discourse. But, but it's now happening everywhere all the time. And we, we sort ourselves into little morally righteous uh, tribes is the, view, is the term that the rabbi uses in the book. So universities could be a model, I think, of restoring some intellectual diversity, some intellectual tolerance, where we have to reasonably argue with each other uh, and, and learn to listen to each other and respond with reasonable arguments. That would help, I think, to deal with the wider problem of chaos in, in liberal democracies. And here's another question about uh, universities. So um, this is from Jonathan Hoffer, and uh, he says, Rabbi Sachs suggests the revival of the university. Can this uh, institution um, be regarded ever as a more universal type of university? A universal institution. Do you think we can get one ever? Um, can we ask this, the person who posed the question to elaborate on the meaning of universal? What does universal mean? 100% uh, access of everybody? What is, where is the universality? Uh, in access, in admission, in what? I don't, don't know. I don't know if he's on the line, no. Uh -huh. no I, was, I was thinking it would be more global, actually, but... Uh, well, whilst we're waiting to see if we get some elaboration, uh, I'm sure that we all share the experience. Uh, uni sorry, universal in value. Yes. Oh, universal. Ah. Okay. Yeah, that, that goes to the heart of, of what this conversation with Rabbi Sachs is all, all about. When he states that uh, morality is universal, uh, that gets a bit tricky, uh, especially in a postmodernist environment that assumption has been challenged. So I think we all need to grapple philosophically and morally with the implications of postmodernism. And I don't know that we have, that the book does it 
uh, as much as I would have liked to see, because certain aspects of the postmodernist critique are correct, and postmodernism created a lot of um, vibrant conversation that could not have been feasible before. Before, women were excluded, the Jews were excluded, uh, Muslims were excluded, and so forth. So the diversity brought about by postmodernism actually undermined some of the assumptions about universality of morality. So I think we need to get deeper into those questions and come up with a philosophical response to postmodernism uh, that could serve us better in the 21st century. So maybe uh, Paul Caris, maybe you have a, a, a way to kind of think along those lines uh, with me. I think that's the challenge of the 21st century, how to articulate a post-postmodern environment that enables us to do exactly what Rabbi Sachs wants us to do, integrated diversity, to be different and equal at the same time, to be respectful of the other while keeping our differences intact. How to do it successfully, that's the challenge. And I'm not sure that we know how to educate people morally to accomplish that challenge. So what would be moral education in the 21st century university? That's for us to decide. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I saw John leaning forward, so I'll just be brief. Uh, I think that the challenge would be that uh, universities have sorted themselves so that many universities have orthodoxies of viewpoint in the social science and humanities. And I would say the predominant one in most universities and colleges is the Nietzschean perspectivalist uh, view, or then the social sciences fleeing from any questions of value and just becoming branches of mathematics. Uh, so if there were more intellectual diversity in universities and colleges, uh, that would achieve a kind of universality of conversation, a kind of healthy heterodoxy. But John, John was leaning forward a minute ago. So. Uh, well, I'll add by stepping just maybe a foot or two beyond the, 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 the university. I, I really liked uh, Rabbi Sachs as a, um, I think it's an aspirational view, uh, articulation when he says, uh, you know, holiness or piety is about the particular, um, you know, and morality is about the universal. Uh, I quite agree that it's we've had a, uh, we have a number of forces, some generated within the university and academia, that have really impaired our ability to understand and reach the universal. That said, it's also the case that it's brought some awareness that what we have at different points thought was a universal common good was not necessarily a very inclusive vision. That was a conversation or a notion of the good that was formed without certain people who were participants, without certain perspectives and views. So I think we probably on this call all share an idea that there ought to be a very robust, even what's sometimes called an agonistic view, which is nobody gets a kind of privileged starting point to be part of that conversation, but everyone can be part of it. And the conversation has to continue. And we do that in, in political and national life, particularly we do it through political rhetoric, we do it through elections and campaigns, uh, particularly healthy elections and campaigns and political activism. Uh, and we're suffering from not being able to uh, have uh, some of those really deep, rich conversations and, you know, guarded by, you know, sort of the, the handrails of civility that, that are necessary for us to think about this being all in this together as part of the, the unum, um, not just the, the pluribus of, uh, of e pluribus unum. Right, well, we've got just time for one last very quick question and answer. And this is from Andrew Briggs. And uh, he says, how can the findings of science help us towards shared moral values? And I know that, um, that it deserves a longer answer, but we've only got a couple of minutes. This question ahead, is for Paul. Paul Davis. Yes, that's right. Well, well uh, and Andrew is, of course, an old friend and, uh, and then uh, the, the question is, you know, can, can scientists sort of come up with a, a, a universal system of moral values? Um, and, and some biologists have tried to do this by appealing to Darwinian principles or uh, evolutionary psychology and so on. Um, I, I, I think what you end up with is a sort of rather basic set of moral values, like uh, it, it pays to be nice to each other and to mostly tell the truth and so on. Um, it, uh, I haven't seen much evidence that uh, it, it really helps uh, with some of the uh, difficult things we've been talking about, like the, uh, the I, we, the, tri the tribalism, uh, the degeneration of democracy, and, and so on. 
uh, it, I, I can't imagine that we would say, well, uh, the, um, uh, some particular, like the Royal Society or the National Academy of Sciences has come up you know, with the following list, a bit like the American Bill of Rights. And, and this is uh, the definitive uh, moral code and you, you'd better stick with it. Uh, uh, so uh, it provides us with a framework, helps us to understand uh, human beings and their feelings, but uh, it, there's still a lot of gaps, I think, uh, left. Okay, well, that, I'm so sad that we've run out of time. And uh, if you've enjoyed our chat, do lo look out for more of our conversations on religion, ethics, and science. So it just remains for me to thank you all once again, Professors Harva Tirosh Samuelson, Paul Davies, John Carlson, and Paul Carice. And thanks, of course, to you, our wonderful audience. And I'm Pauline Davies.